was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes, and I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me. And you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, I'm Penny ST and I'm the host of Peace with Penny. On today's show, we will be speaking with Zafra Lerman, president of the Malta Conference Foundation. The Malta Conference Foundation just completed their 10th symposium of scientists and Nobel laureates aptly named Frontiers of Science, Innovation, Research, and Education in the Middle East, a Bridge to Peace. The Malta Conference's foundation is the only platform in the world which brings together scientists from 15 Middle East countries, Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates, with Nobel laureates to work for five days on solving regional problems, establishing cross-border collaborations, and forging relationships that bridge chasms of distrust and intolerance. Zafra Lerman is a scientist, educator, and humanitarian. She has over 40 distinguished international awards and was just nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for the fifth time. She holds a PhD in chemistry from the Weizmann Institute of Science and conducted research on isotope effects at Cornell and Northwestern Universities in the U.S. and the ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. Ms. Lerman also developed an innovative approach of teaching science at all levels using art, music, dance, drama, rap, and cultural backgrounds. Needless to say, she's a very accomplished and interesting person. Now, before we meet Zafra, I wanted to show you a clip with an overview of how the Malta Conference Foundation works through science to move toward peace in the Middle East. Imagine walking into a room and seeing scientists from Syria, Iraq, Iran, Gaza, Israel, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, and Jordan sitting at a table discussing potential scientific collaborations with civility and friendship. Imagine a bit later in the evening seeing those scientists dancing together. You might be wondering, is this actually real? Yes, it is. And it happens every two years on the island of Malta at the Malta Conferences. The Malta Conferences, brainchild of noted chemist Dr. Safra Lerman, gathers scientists, entrepreneurs, postdocs, and students from 15 Middle East countries, plus Morocco and Pakistan. 
The participants engage in talks and workshops with Nobel laureates and network with other distinguished scientists to identify unique opportunities for collaboration to meet the scientific and technological challenges of the region. More than 700 Middle Eastern scientists and 16 Nobel laureates have attended the Malta conferences since the first conference in 2003. Each conference lasts for five days and deals with issues of science education, air and water quality, medicinal chemistry, biotechnology, nanoscience, nuclear and chemical security and alternative energy sources, among other topics of mutual interest. Science diplomacy is a vital mechanism for working towards peace and stability in the Middle East. Improving regional scientific cooperation aids sustainable economic development and promotes peace and political reconciliation. People-to-people -people contact and mutual understanding can lead to lasting friendships and collaborations that transcend political and cultural differences. Scientists can do what lawyers, diplomats, soldiers and presidents haven't yet been able to do. Chemistry provides hope for peace and understanding in one of the most troubled regions of the world. The Malta Conferences. Science as a bridge to peace. Welcome, Zafra. So do you have a favorite description of the Malta Conference? Uh, what the Malta Conference is uh, doing is using science diplomacy as a bridge to peace in the Middle East by bringing together under the same roof for five days scientists from all the Middle East countries, all of them, and now Morocco and Pakistan are there for by their request. They are not Middle Eastern countries. They are they, Morocco is an Arab Muslim country. Pakistan is a Muslim country, and they asked to participate. And we bring few Nobel laureates, and the idea is to develop collaboration and friendship that can overcome the chasms of distrust and intolerance. Uh, everybody stays in the same place, in the same five-star hotel. Everybody, the Nobel laureate and the graduate students are eating all the meals together. Social events are all together. The people are not separated only for sleeping from each other. So the interaction is going on all the time. And we have plenary lectures by Nobel laureates, and then we have interactive uh, workshops that are on important issues to the region and the world. Like in the last Malta conference, we had water, energy, food security nexus, we had medicinal chemistry, we had nanotechnology, uh, we had science education at all levels, and we had a very important workshop on biological, chemical, and nuclear uh, safety, uh, trying to get rid of all this weapon of mass destruction. We form collaboration because there are a lot of issues that no, no country alone in the region can solve, like uh, air pollution. If one country will clean their air, one wind will bring the pollution for another. The countries are very close to each other. The water, the aqueduct goes along borders because nature and the environment don't know the borders that the British or uh, who knows who put there. So we see the planet as borderless. And uh, therefore you need collaboration to make sure that everybody has clean water to drink and energy to use. And this must be in collaboration between several countries. Uh, the friendship after, if you would see what happened at the end, the tears that people cry to say goodbyes, the hugging is just unbelievable. And usually for holidays, one of the group 
start a congratulation, like for New Year's, we get a happy New Year, but they uh, write it to the Malta family. This is how they feel, that they are all one family. And one Egyptian that was interviewed uh, was asked, what's your nationality? And she said, here all of us have the same nationality. It's called science. We have only one nationality here. And this is practically what the Malta Conference is. And as I said, uh, oh, and we all have guided poster session where everybody can present their research or their work and get input and discuss it. So the Malta Conference, uh, so it's using science diplomacy, it's a bridge to peace, but it helps the scientists to interact with each other during the poster session. And this is a tremendous asset, especially for the graduate student to get input concerning the research. And so it's really a scientific meeting, but we use the science and science policy. Why? Because science policy can overcome uh, barriers like culture, like religion, like uh, language, uh, borders, that other kind of uh, uh, policy cannot uh, do it, so, or uh, diplomacy. So this is why science diplomacy is so successful. It's, so, it, it amazes me, organization after organization that I speak with, meeting each other and talking as humans to one another goes so far in getting rid of all of the crap they've been raised on to be you know all the propaganda and and they're actually surprised to find out that the other side is human it's it's very sad but then again very hopeful because it's just people getting together and interacting in a safe environment and it goes so far okay let me just uh, make a statement the multiple are the only platform in the world that brings together scientists yes. from all the 15 Middle East countries about bringing under the same roof people from all the 15 Middle East countries. There yes. is no other platform in the world that is doing it. Daniel Bernboim started it 30 years ago, having a symphonic orchestra uh, of, and it was in Chicago where it started. This is, you have hundreds of them, okay? Now, what is the difference between the Malta Conference? The, it's wonderful to bring the children so they grow up knowing each other. Time is of essence. By the time they will become leader, it will be too late to try to have some peace there because meanwhile, every week, people are being killed. There is an urgency to bring some solution there. We started the Malta during the second Intifada where everybody told me, you will not manage to bring the 15 countries together. We went through the Intifada. We went through ISIS, where countries did not want to give a visa. No country in the world is looking forward to give a visa to all these 15 countries. No country. Getting a visa is pulling teeth. We were told when we started, why do you need all the Arab countries? Why not all only the Israeli and the Palestinian? And I said, because for many years there are efforts between the Israeli and Palestinian, a lot of uh, programs for students, there is Seed for Peace that is going on for ages, and but nothing is happening. 
we need to bring the people that have the influence, science ministers, education ministers, presidents of universities, presidents of scientific societies. These people have influence. It's wonderful to work with the children, but in order to move something now, we need the people that have influence. So therefore we have intergenerational meeting. We have students, we have early career, and we have the seniors that they have the influence because in most of the countries, excluding the US, scientists have a very special status and they are very, very well respected. Therefore, the idea to bring the scientists that have influence on their government was very important. And this is why we started with influential scientists and with the younger scientists so they will be brought up as leader. So we have intergenerational conference that is just wonderful to see the interaction between students that can sit for five days, have a meal with the Nobel laureate and discuss their work. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Now, we had in the conference a... United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, they are all in the conference. We discussed the relationship with Israel. The first collaboration on COVID-19 between Abu Dhabi and Israel was unveiled in a Zoom Malta conference because during the pandemic, we could not meet because Malta didn't want to let us come and no other country. So this is where it was the first time unveiled in the Malta conference. 568 articles were published all over the world. In the US, it was the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times that published it and had our logo appearing in the New York Times. Okay. We can see some fruit of our effort. There is now a peace agreement, although I hate to use the word peace between people that never were in, at war. But okay, there is a peace agreement between UAE and Israel, Ukraine and Israel. We had already the collaboration meeting. We brought the conference to Morocco in order to start the discussion of normalization in Israel. It was in 2015 that the Malta conference was in Morocco. And I and the Israeli Nobel laureates met with ministers, with uh, advisors, and discussed the normalization. What they told us immediately, we are ready now on the spot to start the scientific exchanges. And the rest we will discuss. So we did it already in 2015. This is the difference between the Malta conferences and between science diplomacy and any other diplomacy. And the idea to bring everybody was the right idea. Because in order to get to the peace, Palestinian, we need all the other countries involved. And this is what we did. How do you decide the participants for the next conferences? I know you've got the 15, but uh, amongst the people who go there, from what I read, it seemed that some participants at least want to go the following year, but um, to get an influx of new people as well, how do you make those decisions? Because you invite I'm people, right? in size. We are going in size, but I'm not too happy because we have to raise the money to mm. bring everybody because we pay for everybody to come. And we are a poor organization. We, are, we don't have paid employees. We are all volunteers. People don't believe it, but this is what it is. It's all volunteers that are doing it. 
everybody wants to come, but we are trying hard to bring new people. And, you know, we are doing it for 20 years. We have people that got older and don't, don't travel anymore. So this is what is so beautiful because the first Malta conference, in the first dinner, every round table had people only from the same country. And I tried to walk around and telling them to mix a little bit. Now, because we have a nucleus that already attended, we don't have this problem because the new ones, even the senior ones from their country are doing and they just fall in place. So we don't have to waste the time anymore to try to mix the countries. In addition, our social events are really, really directed into this interaction. Malta 10, that was the 10th anniversary, our organizer came with the idea to have the Maltese cooking. So we had to divide the people into groups of 10. There was no two people from the same country in any group. So they were all from different countries and the enthusiasm in the cooking and the excitement was unbelievable. The people got together, everybody with a white apron, having the Malta logo and everybody cooking their dish. It was an unbelievable experience that really brought people together. So not the social events are as important as the scientific events. My next question was going to be, what are the key factors to bring together individuals from such disparate cultures, often considered enemies, and have them be willing to work together? This is why it's science diplomacy. Science is a uniting subject. And I always like in my lectures to say that a scientist, or like I'm a chemist, so I always say a chemist from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and a chemist from Bethlehem in the West Bank can communicate without knowing each other's language. They communicate chemistry. And just remember that scientists, not all of them work for peace. We would not have weapon of mass destruction without scientists. Nothing was developed without scientists. The, the nuclear weapon, the, the, the atom bomb, was developed by scientists. So there are scientists from both sides of the line. And our purpose is really, this is why we have a workshop on biological nuclear and the chemical weapon. And because we want the scientists and we we select, you have to be really, really careful in your selection and in vetting everybody that you don't get the wrong people that can, can torpedo the whole conference. So we have to, to know exactly whom we are inviting. And it's by invitation only. That's what I had understood. What are your goals for the Malta conference? My goal is to see more countries signing peace agreement with Israel. And my goal is to see the Palestinian and Israelis living together. I grew up in Israel. I was born a few years before Israel became a state. I played with Arabs kids. We lived together. I, my mother learned to speak Arabic so she could uh, speak to the neighbors and everything was rationed. So the Jews liked the sugar. The Arabs liked the rice. So I remember my mother changing with our Arab uh, neighbors a glass of uh, rice for a glass we are in America, a cup of rice with a cup of sugar. And we were sitting, all of us together. She she spoke Arabic. So mm -hmm. she 
speak to all the neighbors and I and I see the people in the conference. I see the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's like one family. I see how they interact. I see how and as a matter of fact, as a result of the of the Malta conference, we had a Palestinian spending a sabbatical and this is a very high-level Palestinian with influence, spending a whole year sabbatical at the Weizmann Institute of Science, and it was 2014, the year he spent the sabbatical. And he continued his sabbatical during uh, 2014. Uh, Gaza doesn't have any clean drinking water. It's all contaminated. So we had a collaboration between El Azar University in Gaza and Technion in Israel, testing the water and developing together a way to help purify their water. So uh, if you are in the conference, you would not know who is a Palestinian who, and who is an Israeli. It's, they are flying together, they are coming, they, they are sitting together. So we can see, and I want to see, I always am worried that people that have fight for peace will never become Prime Minister of Israel or President of the West Bank. But the people really, really want peace and take care of their children and and live a decent life where they have what they need and can enjoy life. And this is what I want to see with the Malta conferences. I want to see what I see in the Malta conference between all these 15 countries in Morocco, in Pakistan, Morocco already signed a peace agreement. It will be nice for Pakistan too. But I want to see all these countries living in peace. There are brilliant people on all sides of the border. We had brilliant young uh, PhD students in this, in Malta 10, there were Palestinians, Haki, Iranians, and mainly women. <laughs> the young students were mainly women. And they were brilliant. They had the future. So this is what I hope to see. So this is what you chose to call your conference. Is it different every year, the theme? The only, the, there were several changes, but basically it's the same because we started as a I chaired for 26 years for the American Chemical Society, the mm -hmm. Subcommittee on Scientific Freedom and Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And therefore I was in the Soviet Union, going through dark alleys after midnight, giving seminar at two o'clock in the morning, at dark ethics. But after September 11, I suggested to the board of the American Chemical Society that it's time to concentrate on the Middle East. And I brought the proposal of the Malta Conferences. It was not called Malta Conferences. It got the name only after the first conference that was in Malta. This is why it got the name. And mm -hmm. I Instead, uh, in the beginning, there was silence. You could hear people only breathing. And then be, uh, the whole the people from all the 15 Middle East countries. And I said, yes, I need all of them for peace in the Middle East. At the end, the board approved it. And it was an, an American Chemical Society a program run by my uh, um, subcommittee. This was very good for us. They were responsible on all the things I hate to do, administration, paperwork, uh, finances, submitting 990 to IRS, and all that they did. I was involved in inviting the participants and in working with the organizing company and it was a project by a, a, a 
American Chemical Society that we say eight years. So it started with the title Frontiers of Chemical Sciences, mm. Research and Education in the Middle East, A Bridge to Peace. Mm. But in 2010, the, the new chair of the board came uh, to make a long story short, the committee was dissolved. And then the ACS uh, decided in order to, for us to be able to raise money uh, that we should become a non-profit 501c3. So by that stage, the, the, we started inviting all sorts of scientists, physicists, biologists, geologists, hydrologists, engineers, because the problem that have to be solved cannot solve, be solved only by chemists. So we took the chemical science out and we called it Frontiers of Science. But mm. in the last several Malta, on request by the participant, we have an innovation and entrepreneurship component in the conference that people really like it. And uh, so mm -hmm. we change it again to innovation, research, and education in the Middle East, the Bridge to Peace. So it evolved with the time and with what Malta is doing. Wonderful. And your group photo? A uh, whole group. And on the, in front is the reg really the head table. The lady mm -hmm. white, she attended several Malta conferences as a member of the French parliament. Mm -hmm. She has two Oscars too. Uh, he, she just now, uh, is not anymore in the in the parliament, but very active. So she continued to come. They had table. Everybody uh, greeted the participant, and in the middle we have the president of the uh, Republic of Malta. Uh, the lady with the white jacket is the French ambassador to Malta. The man next to her is the president of the Israeli Chemical Society and the president-elect of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Wow. So we had a lot of dignitaries at the head table that mm -hmm. greeted the participants. The French ambassador, she was wonderful. So she hosted one night the whole group. So wow. A guest one night, yeah, she hosted us. We had the president of the American Chemical Society, but she got lost with the group there. And she greeted the participants in the American Chemical Society sponsored the first reception, the beginning of the conference that was on Sunday, is always on Sunday. So the American Chemical Society sponsored the first reception and the first dinner. And she gave a talk to the participants about the American Chemical Society that is the largest, most influential, uh, one subject scientific society in the world. How great. Okay. And the lecture? This is just the audience is sitting and listening, and you can see they all listen and to a plenary lecture by a Nobel laureate. Plenary lecture are being given only by Nobel laureate. And lately we added distinguished scientist with a Middle East origin that probably will get the Nobel Prize. But the majority wow. of the lectures are only Nobel laureates. Okay. 
The women's workshop. This is the women's workshop in Malta 8. The women decided that they should be organized and support each other because in different countries, women have different status. And so they formed the Women Forum. And in Malta 9, we had the first forum as a request. We had now for the forum a workshop. And you can see how many women we participated. Not all the women are here because parallel to that was a workshop on water, energy, food security, nexus. We always have two parallel to each other. But the interesting thing was that several men participated. And I heard from the women that it was very important to have this man in the forum and get their input and that they could hear what are the complaints that women have. And they, we decided that women should, men, senior women should mentor the younger women. So it was an extremely successful women workshop. Oh, great. Yeah. This is... Uh, we took a picture of the students and the early career people. And the reason they were photographed separately because the American Chemical Society sponsored 15 of the young people to come to the conference and the Bader Foundation sponsored 10, so we wanted to send them a picture to see all the young people that they sponsored. This is the head table. Well, I mentioned most of the people already, but we can go again to the right. The man with the white hair is the president of the Council of Sesame. Sesame is a synchrotron, uh, the first synchrotron in the Middle East that uh, was built in uh, Jordan. And the countries that are members of that, if I can remember, are Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan, Palestinian Authority, and I think I mentioned oh, Cyprus. So this is a synchrotron that scientists can go and do experiments in the facility in Jordan. Next to him is the president of the American Chemical Society. And next to her is the representative of Jordan. He, he, he was a foreign minister. He was ambassador in a lot of uh, countries. And he is advisor to His Royal Highness Prince Hassan bin Talal, King Hussein's brother and one of the people I admire most in the Middle East. He attended several Malta conferences, and he could not come to this one, so he sent me a personal letter to read to the participant, and his advisor attended the conference. Next to him is the French ambassador I talked about here, to my other side is the president of the Republic of Malta, Dr. George Vela. That they had the, in, in Malta, you can be president only for five years and you could not be re-elected. So because we move the conference around, usually we have always a different president. But because both Malta 9 and Malta 10 were in Malta, Dr. George Vela was participating in two Malta conferences, and he's very interested in the environment. So he went to see all the posters on the environment and talking to the presenters of the poster. He did not just give his talk. He really uh, went to see uh, the, the posters on environment. Next to him is the lady that attended several Malta conferences, a member of the French parliament. 
and next to her is the president of the Israeli Chemical Society, who is the president of elect of the International Union of Pure Employed Chemists. Terrific. The Nobel laureates are very important for the conference, and they are a very big attraction for uh, people to come because it's a very unique situation where in such a small conference you have several Nobel laureates, and it's tremendous opportunity for every scientist to interact and discuss with them their own project and their own research. So for the 10 Malta conferences, we had 17 Nobel laureates already. And I think this one shows probably 16. One, two, three, four, five, six, twelve. And for more, yeah, we have now one more. Mm-hmm. Most of them participate in several Malta conferences. They continue to come because they feel that it's a very important uh, cause and they would like to contribute to the cause. So there are Nobel laureates that have participated in five, six, or seven conferences. Now in Malta 10, we had again Nobel laureates that were before, but we had a new Nobel laureate, so therefore it's now 17. Wonderful. I thought this was such a beautiful picture because it just showed the humanity of the discussion that was going on, whatever that was. It's true. It was the, the person that took this picture, and I don't know who it was, took a wonderful picture because it's a Nobel laureate, Old Hoffman from Cornell University, that attended almost every Malta conference. He's here in discussion with several women from the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Beautiful pe- picture to see this discussion going on in the free time. It, probably it was the coffee break because we have several coffee break where the people. Mm-hmm interact with each other. This was a fun time, I understand. This was a very fun time. In the beginning, I was a little bit worried how, you know, Nobel laureates and presidents of societies and presidents of university will feel about cooking suddenly. But it was a tremendous experience and everybody had a great time. We arrived and we usually have a tour of Valletta, it's the capital of Malta, and we tell the people, don't go because we'll have organized tour and you will see everything you have to see. So, and this tour, the end of the tour was cooking, learning to cook Maltese food. So when we arrived, everybody received an apron with the Malta logo and everybody, men and women, love to have this apron. And I am in a picture here with my vice president of the Malta conferences. And Nelly, she was the president of the American Chemical Society several years ago. And we decided to take a picture together with our beautiful aprons. And it was an unbelievable, everybody was enjoying it, laughing. It was just a fun, fun experiment. Very cool. And did you enjoy the food? (laughs) I am a very, very picky eater. I eat, oh. God, uh, my mother used to say that anybody that wants to lose weight should eat with me. <laughs> so I think I tasted few of the dishes, but I don't eat beef because I don't eat the animals. But I think I tasted maybe there's some, there's some bread puddings that they did. <laughs> <laughs> so you make great friendships, I understand. Look at this picture. It's a, it's a very touchy picture. I cannot say exactly from where the people are, but they are from very different countries that are not in peace with each other. And look at the people. 
the love that is formed in the conference. Beautiful. So you have quite a number of uh, accomplishments uh, from the uh, different outcomes from the conference. So if you could, there's a couple of slides to go over about uh, different accomplishments that you've had. Yeah. As I said, we have a lot of collaboration on the water issues so, uh, with uh, money from the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. We formed a water quality assessment group from Jordan, the Palestinian Authority, Israel, Egypt, and Kuwait. This was funded by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, a transboundary partnership with Israel, Palestinian Authority, and Jordan was a form that I mentioned before, the collaboration between the Technion and El Azar concerning the water in Gaza. Already twice, we had a unanimous uh, resolution about the serious degradation of the water quality in Gaza. The resolution was written by the scientists from Gaza and Israel and presented to all the participants that voted for that. The first resolution was earlier, and this was uh, delivered to Tony Blair, who was the a quartet envoy for the UN, US, EU, and uh, Russia. The second resolution was in Malta 809, and this was sent to a lot of uh, governments. And the important thing is that the resolution is published in a lot of uh, papers and magazines so people can see, and the resolution calls upon the governments to put aside their animosity and guarantee clean drinking water for Gaza. Very cool. And this other listing? In Malta 1, after Malta 1, the participants uh, brought together the president of the Weizmann Institute of Science and the president of El Quds University to sign an agreement. El, El, the graduates from El Quds, their degree is not recognized by the Higher Academy Committee of Israel. So in order for them to be able to pursue a PhD at Weizmann, we had the two presidents sign a, an agreement that Weizmann will take in the graduates from El Quds. Also, their degree is not recognized by Israel, and several of them did the PhD at Weizmann, and now they are back on the West Bank and teaching in different universities. And I mentioned before that uh, during 2014, there was a sabbatical, a uh, Palestinian spending a sabbatical. A uh, Nobel laureate, Whitey Lee, in Taiwan, and he is responsible for a big synchrotron. So he offered uh, fellowships, one year fellowships uh, in two Malta three in each of them, six fellowship all together to pay for everything for six Middle Eastern to come and be a year and work on the synchrotron in Taiwan so they can go after that and help the Sesame synchrotron in Jordan. So this was a very great achievement too that we had. What a, Oh, we we had several mini Malta conferences, and mainly uh, concentrating in trying to make science education somehow unified all over the Middle East. So, and it's interesting. It's Egyptian 
educator that insisted that ethics will be an important component of every any curriculum in the Middle East. And this was a very, very important uh, part. Then, sure, the friendships uh, that were formed are unbelievable. And sometimes in uh, American chemical society, I see several from our participants that were sent by their university, and it's like meeting relatives. Yeah. It's not strangers, it's relatives that are meeting each other. Yeah, how beautiful. That is just so wonderful that uh, you've been able to bring together people uh, in for to do important work and also uh, to bond with one another. I so, in my trip now, I uh, was invited to Egypt and to Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, and to Morocco by <laughs> participants of the Malta Conference. Wow. Yeah, so I just uh, visited these countries and lectured in these countries. Wonderful. Myself, I'm trying to really meet as many participants as I can, or in their own countries, or in some international conference, because I by myself cannot go to all sure. countries that participate, but I try to meet as many as possible between cons. So the scientists didn't invent cloning yet, huh? To <laughs> duplicate yourself. <laughs> this is what we discuss now, because you see my husband, he was the youngest, that became the, the youngest a deputy administrator for Middle East. In USAID, he had a budget of $5 billion working, but he visited every single Middle East country. And he really was very familiar, and he was a lot of help. Mm, I'm so sorry about your loss. I care to an excellent editor. So mm. He was a tremendous help, but Malta 10 was the first conference that he was not alive, and I had to pull it off almost all by myself, and I just told the board that I cannot continue to do it all by myself, and that we need, because if something happens to me, what yeah. is it? And this is what we discuss now. Yeah. Problem. When yeah. The organization depends on one person, but we we are trying now to bring in people that can uh, will be able to take hold. Yep, succession planning. It's really yeah. important. Succession planning. Yeah, you are right. This is what we are now working on. We have a committee that works on succession. I know the concept of the conferences was developed after 9-11 in 2001. And right. had you worked on peace projects before that? And if so, why? Yes, I was involved in 79. They, were, they formed in the U.S. the Albert Einstein Peace Prize Foundation. Mm. I was on the executive committee. I was the youngest, and people asked me, what are you doing there? I said, I enjoy lowering the average age. <laughs> Not anymore after so many years. Yeah. So we gave every year a, a Albert Einstein Peace Prize. We gave it to very famous uh, people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, several of them went on and got the Peace Nobel Prize, and 
several already got the peer, like Andrei Sakharov, we gave him, but he got the peace prize before. We gave it to Joe Rodblad, that was the executive director of uh, Padwash, that received Padwash received the peace prize, and they shared it with Joe Rodblad. Uh, we gave it to Alva Mirdel, and then she got the Peace Nobel Prize. So I was very involved with that. But in 82, after Israel signed the peace agreement with Egypt, and really it was almost no war agreement, but nothing was happening, we came in with the idea to build an agricultural settlement like a moshav in Israel that we will be able to use Israeli expertise to work with the Egyptian to build this uh, settlement. So we organized a conference this was my first science diplomacy, and it was held in June of 1982 in Ajaccio, Corsica. And we brought a delegation of agronomists from Israel, and we brought a delegation from Egypt. And the idea was to have them work together. And uh, we succeeded, and the place still exists in the Mariut area on the way to Alexandria. So this was my first really involvement in science diplomacy. Do you do any work with the Arava Institute? <laughs> A lot of work. Yeah? So cool. They, the director of the Arava Institute is a Malta participant from Malta One. Ah, cool. That's you, very cool. Yes, so uh, you've accomplished so much. Is there anything left that is just, do you have a burning desire to accomplish that you haven't yet? Yes. It's peace between the Israelis. Peace and understanding yes. between the Israelis and the Palestinian. Yeah. I, I interact a lot with both sides and I and I see them because I go a few times a month and it breaks my heart, all the barriers that we have uh, that really, really should be overcome. And uh, I am worried. Yeah. What do you think are the biggest obstacles from your vantage point? For peace? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what is the biggest obstacle for peace in the world. Politicians. Yeah. Politicians. You know, yeah. the biggest obstacle, the leaders that we have, it's all over Look at what we have now in uh, Russia and Ukraine. I mentioned Ukraine in our gala dinner. That was an unbelievable event. And at the end, I said, we are all celebrating, but we have to remember that there are people that are being killed every minute now in the Ukraine. And we have to yeah. bring them too. So one man. It's only one man. We had a Holocaust, only one man. And this is the problem. After 10 conferences and impressive results, the Malta Conference is touted as a model to follow. What parts of the conference do you feel have been the most effective for your goals? Uh, the whole model, the reason that Pakistan asked to participate is because they want to do a model like that between Pakistan and India in Kashmir. Uh, we had on the board a Korean uh, that was interested in the model for South and North Korea. I already was approached to 
do a Malta for the scientists from Russia and Ukraine. And so this is a model that can work all over because scientists are the same everywhere. And this is what is so great about science diplomacy that we can pick that, just take it, it, it's culture blind, it's language blind, it's religious blind, it's language blind, and therefore it can fit in any place in the world. Do times of violence like now or in May 2021 impact the conferences? And if so, how? It's yes and no. It's harder to get the participants, but we get them. So this is where it's a problem. But the minute there is a problem somewhere, especially when we had ISIS, no country wanted to give visa to our uh, scientists from Iraq and, mm-hmm. uh, and Syria. And this is why we went to Morocco, that it's an Arab Muslim country. And it was a big problem there. At the end, I wrote to the advisor to the king an email. And the email said that the American, how will we ever have peace in the world if an American Israeli Jewish woman has to fight with the authorities of an Arab Muslim country to allow brave Arab Muslims, scientists, want to work for peace to enter the country. At the end, they came. Wonderful. What do you consider some of your greatest accomplishments? What What feels the best to you? In my lifetime, you ask? Yeah. Homeless kids that I taught them science. I, I was the head of the Science Institute at Columbia College. So I and my faculty taught homeless kids in a dance studio, teaching science through dance. Oh, I got a lot of money, millions of dollars from the National Science Foundation in order to teach teachers how to teach in the inner city with using art, music, dance, and drama to teach and to assess students. And I developed this method because I mentioned to you uh, Rabbi Hillel, what he said, everything you hate to be done to you, do to your friends. So I always told my students, I consider you my friends. So I cannot do to you what I hated to be done to me. And this is to sit one hour with a multiple choice test and show all my knowledge in one hour that maybe I did not feel well. You will not do it. You can show me your knowledge in any way you want. You can sing, you can dance, you can have a theater, and this is how you can show me your knowledge. This was very successful with inner city students. And this is why we went into the inner city of Chicago and worked with parents and teachers and students. And uh, so they could adapt this method of teaching. How cool. That, oh, I love creativity. That's wonderful. Can Many- you describe that? I was so, I, I read about that and I was so curious. What exactly does that mean? How do you do that? You can see the the videos. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, my students taught me because Columbia College was an art and communication uh, college. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was only in very fancy scientific institutes. Technion, Weizmann Institute, Cornell, Northwestern, the Etterheim in Switzerland. So I had to learn how to teach art, dance, theater, music students, chemistry. Why don't we listen to a clip and hear the students sing about the ozone layer to the tune of I've Got Plenty of Nothing from Porgy and Bess. Oh, 
I got plenty of ozone, and ozone's plenty for me. I got no C's, I got no F's, I got no CFC's. There are folk with plenty of ozone, got a lock on their door. Scared that air conditioners and refrigerators are gonna eat their ozone away, away. You see, I ain't a fret to my dim till the time arrives. They can come up here all they want. That's okay with me, cause as long as my bond stays connected and strong, I am free. Oh, I got plenty of ozone, and ozone's plenty for me. I got my O's, and it's times three, up here in the Earth stratosphere. No use complaining. I got my O's, it's times three, way up here. I got plenty of ozone, and ozone's plenty for me. I stop the sun's ultra rays, ultraviolet rays. There are folk with plenty of ozone, got to pray all the day. It seems with ozone, you sure got to worry how to keep the gases away, away. You see, I ain't a fret to my dim till the time arrives. Never worry long all the time, just because I am part of the atmosphere, stratosphere, way up here in the sky. Oh, I got plenty of ozone, and ozone's plenty for me. I got my O, and it's times three, up here in the Earth's stratosphere. No use complaining, cause I got my O way up here. These students were invited to a very exclusive Gordon conference that only 100 or 120 scientists are invited from all over the world. In 2001, it was in Mount Holyoke in the US, the chair asked me if I can raise the money and bring 20 of them to show the scientists how they visualize science. So I managed to bring them, and they showed the scientists how they dance the periodic table and how they form table salt, and the whole periodic table and the chemical bond they did through dance, and they did a dance on the three state of matter, and at the end, the audience was standing and screaming, bravo. They just could not believe it. And several of them went to college to study science, and two continued for a PhD in, uh, in uh, biochemistry. This is, for me, a big achievement that they... In a lot of places, the method was adopted and it did miracles with underprivileged. I adopted the school district of Soweto in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, the only uh, city that had on one street two Nobel laureates because Mandela and Bishop Tutu Bos were born in Soweto and they did great with this method. But what I'm proud more is my work on human rights and to see people that I brought to freedom by risking my own life. And this is a tremendous pleasure for me and a great... Could you day. talk about that in more detail? I, I was going to get to get that and I, I really wanted to be sure we did. Um, can you talk about what you did? Yeah. Okay, I I had on human rights two hats. I was the chair of the subcommittee on scientific freedom and human rights for the American Chemical Society, but I am the vice chair for chemistry of the board of the Committee of Concerned Scientists that is dedicated only to human rights. It's a standalone 501c3. So... I went several times to the Soviet Union with a group of chemists. And during the day, we get, we're guests of different universities. 
lecturing, participating in lecture. And usually after midnight, I left to do human rights. And because I met Andrei Sakharov when we gave him mm -hmm. uh, Albert Einstein Peace Prize, he could not speak English. I had to speak to him through a, a interpreter. And mm -hmm. he got the Peace Nobel Prize before we gave him. He got the Nobel Peace Prize before we gave him our Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. And he told me that if I want to be successful, I have to take a crash course in Russian because everybody I interact, I will interact into his guides and everybody will really be a KGB. So I took a crash course in Russia and in Russian and went back and I arranged with, uh, with the help of the Committee of Concerned Scientists uh, I worked with the refuseniks, mm. uh, the Jewish scientists that wanted to leave and were fired. Few were sent to jail, to prison. And so uh, we arranged in advance for me to meet the dark alley after midnight, uh, several refused Nick, and then we walked and collected more, and we ended up in an apartment Outland. that were, had a, a dark attic there. Anyhow, these refused Nicks were fired from the jobs. They were not uh, allowed to get any scientific material or keep their, their work. Uh, their knowledge in science. So I brought scientific magazines with me, what was illegal in the Soviet Union. I gave seminars. And what I did, I took back the resumes of all of them so we could work on their behalf. And uh, what can I say? Many of them came all to the U.S. or to Israel as a result of our work on their behalf when uh, there was the case of Libya arresting a Palestinian doctor in five uh, uh, Bulgarian nurses, and they decided that they were spreading AIDS in the hospital and gave them a death penalty. We got into action on that too. And the death penalty was reversed, and they could leave to go to Bulgaria. Uh, so the pleasure and letters I got from dissidents uh, writing letters to the ACS about their American angel and different terms like that. Speaking of wonderful letters, Afra. Let me read a quote from a letter from Yuri Tarnopolsky, who was one of the dissidents in the Soviet Union who was sent to hard labor in Siberia. The quote here is from a letter that he wrote about you. I often wondered what could make a person living in freedom, safety, and comfort to fight for somebody deprived all of that and languishing somewhere on the other side of the globe. I realized that both the faraway victim and his American guardian angel had something in common. They had the same ability to go against the tide, and they did for science something which could hardly be rationalized, an exhausting, messy job of fixing its very foundation, invisible on the pages of professional journals. They kept science both human and humane. Yuri Tarnopolsky. Well, that's a great way to end our interview today. Thanks so much, Safra, for your time today and what you've done to make this world a better, more peace-filled place. Next week, we'll be speaking with Reverend Canon Nicholas T. Porter, Executive Director of Jerusalem Peace Builders. Their vision is a Jerusalem and a world where Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Druze live together as sisters and brothers in dignity, equality, and peace. 
Jerusalem Peace Builders, or JPB, is an interfaith nonprofit organization with a mission to create a better future for humanity across religions, cultures, and nationalities. Integral to that mission is the belief that the future of Jerusalem is the future of the world. To that end, JPB promotes transformational person to person encounters among the peoples of Jerusalem, Israel, Palestine, and the United States. They have many enlightening programs bringing together Israeli, Palestinian, and American teens and young adults together in the United States, Israel, and in the Palestinian territories in summer camps, leadership programs, four-year programs of conflict resolution in high schools in Israel, and adult programs of travel, educator training, and a program for empowering women. They are creating peace builders by providing them necessary skills to change the paradigm in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and create a better world. We hope you can join us on March 7th. Thank you, and may you live in peace, shalom, and salam. Music